So this is secure because math, a deep dive on machine learning based monitoring. So please join me in welcoming Alex Pinto. Thank you guys. Glad to see you all here. And uh, just before we start, I just want to ask uh, for all of you that are from the internet and you like to do the twitterings, uh, I, we do have a hashtag for the talk. So make sure that when you make fun of me, you actually hashtag it or tag me or anything like that because I also do want to laugh. I, I, I found out at, at another conference that actually checking Twitter while you're talking is like a social faux pas. You can't actually do that. So I can't read the funny stuff that you guys are, uh, are talking about. But anyway, thank you so much. Let's get started. So just a little bit about me, right, before we, we, we go to it. So uh, chief data scientist at MLSec Project. The cool thing about have, doing your own stuff is that you can just make up any title that you want. Uh, I've pretty much been doing machine learning researching and training for uh, a while now. And uh, just for anyone who are interested in this subject, I found out that machine learning training is very different from Pokemon training. So I, <laughs> I might have got the wrong brochure or something. But uh, anyway. Uh, well, for Twitch is on, right? You, you guys might enjoy it. Um, anyway, I'm focusing my research on network security and a little bit of incident response. I, I was pretty much tortured uh, by, by Sims as a child. I never want to have to do that again. So I'm, pre I'm trying to figure out a way that where we have to do less with it or maybe do it in a more smart way. Anyway. Uh, if for some reason you guys think I hacked something and you need like an attribution hacker animal for me, I am caffeinated capybara. All right? <laughs> Let's get going. Uh, anyway, I want to start out talking about uh, what is obviously the uh, upcoming security singularity because of all the amazing machine learning products that are being launched like two a week. So yeah, we must be pretty close to Skynet by now. Uh, and I just want to make sure that while I do that, I give you guys some context, uh, specifically about uh, the messaging uh, of, I mean, I, I obviously don't know uh, uh, in precise detail technically uh, what these companies are doing. It's all very secretly saucy and stuff like that. But I can guess based on their marketing materials and I just wanted to break down for you what I think that those people are doing and if that's what they are doing. So maybe these are the questions you should be asking them because this stuff is hard. I mean, honestly, math is hard. And uh, uh, there's a lot of potential pitfalls and there's a lot of uh, kind of uh, due diligence in your experiments. And I just really want to, for us to spend some time, some quality time together talking about math here while we can uh, try to decode this a little bit. Anyway, let's get going. So I specifically would like to thank all of you because you guys are all on vacation now. You know, nobody has to work anymore. And uh, you guys actually coming here to see someone talk about security. I mean, why? This is all solved, right? Has been solved for a while now. And it's sad. It's sad because the guys who actually did this network security solve thing, they have absolutely nothing to do with machine learning. I just thought that this was so amazing that I had to put it out there. Maybe they should pursue machine learning products because that would make it even more awesome, I think. Anyway, uh, of course, you, you kind of get the point where I'm coming from. But uh, before I continue, I just want to make a quick side note. If you guys ever do a Google Images search for network security solved, Jack Daniel is the first hit. Man, <laughs> that's branding. That's branding. I'll tell you that, man. It's, 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 it's just, just amazing. I wish I was, but anyway, I mean, who knows? Maybe Pokemon trainer someday. The point is, uh, uh, there is a lot of confusion, right? And this is understandable. There's always a lot of confusion about the specific technologies that we're working on. We're always like, uh, for some reason, uh, there's a cycle where we stop trusting our old shit and we start looking for new shit. So people have to come up with new stuff that we do. Uh, and uh, the point is that I'm frequently being asked a bunch of questions because of the kind of work that I'm trying to do. Hey, I'm talking to this guy and this guy tells me he's doing the maths or something like that. Can you help me out? Can you try to understand? And this is not, I'm not talking about, you know, someone at the street. These are people who are, have been doing extensive uh, 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 product research or have been, uh, been actual uh, running information security programs for a while. And they really uh, are failing to grasp what the hell the companies are doing. It's, it's almost like, you know, there was some sort of 
marketing ploy to make it kind of obscure so, and kind of make people think that it's better than it is. I'm not saying it's that, but it, maybe you could argue the point. So, um, and I think that's kind of bad for everyone, right? And this is, this is pretty much the, the, the point that I'm coming from here. Uh, by the way, if any of you guys ever want to do like a big data presentation, there's this big data pix tumbler. It's awesome. It's all like waves with bits. It's like it's the, the best stock images for big data ever. <laughs> but uh, anyway, no, public so I'm here to teach something, right? This, if you take something out of this talk, it's big data pix.tumbler. Anyway. <laughs> I guess my point is, are we even trying to explain, I mean, what the hell is a hyperdimensional security analytics? You guys know that, you guys know that like, if it's more than three, it's already hyper, right? So, uh, I mean, uh, third generation artificial intelligence, what is it, it's like the third level of the matrix. What is that? I mean, honestly, uh, I, it, it, it kind of gets to me because, I mean, aren't, isn't it enough to go to do the cyber wars and things like that to actually scare people? Do we actually have to scare them with math as well? I mean, <laughs> yeah, so, and there's the eponymous security because math, which I, I wasn't able to find again. I, I don't know if I dreamt it or if it was actually the slogan of a company, uh, but I think it's perfect. It's exactly that. It's secure because math, right? It's ma ma math. <laughs> math. <laughs> The point, okay, this is hurting us, right? We are unable to differentiate between the products. We are unable to understand what they're doing. The investors have no idea. They're funding stuff. Uh, I mean, it's like, yay, I got the security magical thing here. Oh my God, here's like $10 million. And the, the point, and it's like, we're not even sure if this thing works yet in many, many levels and many kinds of things. And uh, I mean, I don't know about you guys, I don't have a lot of time to waste. I don't want to be like beta testers of a bunch of this stuff, right? I wanted to make sure that the people who are actually, who are trying to do the research or are trying to actually do the work, I can have some way to identify more easily if what they're talking makes sense or not. I mean, I have people argue to me the point that it's all about communication really, right? It, you get the people from the technical side of things, <laughs> right? And they try to explain. <laughs> Come on, guys, I gotta keep a straight face here. And they try to explain to the people to, in the marketing field okay, this is like what we do. So we peak this, we do this fixture selection process where we're actually working on a sub manifest. No, 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 no. Okay, that sounds advanced. Yeah, let's go with advanced. So uh, maybe it's that. Maybe I'm being unfair. Maybe there's a lot of, of different, uh, uh, very good stuff happening under the hood. But I sure as hell cannot figure it out. Right by reading what you're doing, and uh, anytime you, you try to get a little bit closer, it's like no, 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 no. That's our secret sauce. That's like the man. man. It's like someone telling you, honestly, my perspective is like no, 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 no. I'm using this proprietary crypto algorithm that you can't really know about, and to to an extent, it's that. I, I want to argue the point that it's it, it's that. So, so it's still in marketing. Let's do an exercise. So I want you guys to guess the ear when this was, this was written. Uh, so I'm gonna make it more simpler because it's like, it's not, not, there's gonna be a lot of interaction here. So of the three of them, which one do you think was written like today or like 2014? I, mean, I, 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 would, I like show hands for number one. Okay, there's like very, very few people. Uh, show hands for number two. Okay, still very few people. And show hands for number three. Okay, it looks like you guys don't like to play games. But <laughs> <laughs> the point, that, man, there's no right or wrong here. The, all these taglines suck, so don't worry about it. Uh, the, well, anyway, the first one is actually from 10 years ago. It's, uh, it's uh, I don't know if there's any ISS buffs here, guys who used to work with the ISS stuff, and they released the network anomaly detection product. And uh, I used to work for uh, one of the largest integrators they had in Latin America. Was like, I mean, a huge thing. And we sold like the bazillion and it, uh, su successful bazillion implementations of IPSs. We never could get that shit to work. I don't know, maybe it was just us. But uh, <laughs> the, if you go to, if you, it, the, the middle one is actually from this year. I'm not going to tell you who it is, but I mean, you can do a Google search. And uh, the third one, it's, it's actually when it gets interesting. It's actually from, 1995. 
It's from actually some uh, uh, some some research that was uh, that is being done, uh, and they uh, it's kind of a university research that they created a product, pretty much like I don't know when Bro came out. It was a, it was a university research that did a project. It was like that. We're doing anomaly detection on user activity. That sounds very familiar, right? And uh, there's this woman, there's Dorothy Denning. She's a respected professor at the Naval Postgraduate School. She actually did the first paper that came up with what an IDS should look like in, in 86. And it already said that, okay, there's kind of two parts of this. One part of it is like it's a rule-based engine while we have some sort of signatures. And the other part of it will be an anomaly detection engine that will help pick up the stuff that we, I mean, no, maybe we probably potentially don't have signatures for. Maybe this will give you a hint, but we're quite sure this is going to have a lot of false positives. So let's keep the people informed that they shouldn't trust this part as much as that part. So, 86. And uh, anyway, sh they actually built it out to, to the intrusion detection expert system. I think people dropped the E because, I don't know, it's too, too many letters, it's too confusing. Uh, but the point, uh, the, the point that I find funny actually, so this, that, that actual quote from 95 was actually the, her colleagues, I'm pretty sure all male, stole her work and made it like the next generation IDES. You, you guys think, uh, I mean, the next generation has been, has been a while for, uh, for a while here, guys. So. Anyway, let's get with the times, right? And uh, the point, what, everything changed uh, because of a three-letter acronym, really. So there was a three-letter acronym that did, did something that was very significant uh, for information security and uh, that actually changed the way that we do research and we do a lot of things in this area. It's probably not who you're thinking of. It's the KDD. The KDD is actually a, a, a program from a program. It's kind of a, a, a research track or, or the conference from, from ACM. And, in 19, and guided by DARPA, right? Because DARPA thought, okay, we have Bro, we have Snort. You know what? We're probably never going to need another different signature engine. And boy, were they right. Uh, and uh, they decided to start funding things like anomaly detection and uh, creating data sets that people could actually use to do that. Right? So DARPA had their own data sets, which was focused on user anomaly detection. Man, I'm talking like Solaris audit logs. It's like, whoa. <laughs> and uh, and uh, also the KDD99 data set came out, which is, was pretty much uh, an extract of a log. It was already a little bit parsed. It was not PCAPs. It was not TCP dump. But okay, this is what the network of this place look like, uh, of this specific, uh, I don't know, organization looks like for like six weeks. Right? I, we know that there are some attacks here. Let's see if you, can, if you can pick it up. And it was a great success. It was a great success in the sense that uh, a lot of people started using those data sets for research and there was nothing previously there that people could reliably use and, and repeat. So a lot of the research uh, was based on this and they used this to actually try to improve their algorithms. And uh, I mean, at, at first it was okay. Uh, but after a while, if you go through the, the, I mean, it's like one bazillion papers in 99. And as you go uh, across the years, it's like, looks like everyone is trying to one up the other one. Yeah, I got a, let, a little better percentage, a little better percentage on this data set. And uh, that's fine. That's like, I don't know, that's academic tag. I don't know how, what the fuck they do there. But the, the, what bothers me is that if you do a, a search on Google Scholar today, there are 300 papers. In 2014, they are still using this 15-year-old data set to come up with conclusions with what is good and what is bad and what is promising in anomaly detection. I mean, I have no idea what exactly is the modified mutual information-based feature selection, but don't do it in a 15-year-old data set. I'm pretty sure there's, I'm pretty sure things have kind of evolved, things have kind of changed, right? And, uh, and uh, I understand that there are limitations, right? I understand that there's, that's, there's this reproducibility thing, which, I mean, it's, it's, it's for some, some respect, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to that, but I want you guys to think about this. I want you guys to think about this as if you're going to med school, right? And you're, start, you're, you're starting to, like, you're gonna learn a, uh, 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 anatomy, right? And all that you have to go for is this picture of Rembrandt, right? <laughs> Granted, the human body hasn't changed that much, right? But uh, it's like, hey, professor, why don't we cut a fresh one open? No, 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 no. That would be a privacy violation. The IRB would not be up with that. 
So, uh, and uh, okay, I'm not, I'm not uh, advocating like uncontrolled sharing or anything like that or rogue experiments, but I'm pretty sure we can do better on public data sets right now. I'm pretty sure there's enough people interested in this that we can actually try to generate more stuff that people can use for, for, for this research, right? And uh, a funny side note is that actually there was a professor from Carnegie Mellon that was pretty much in 2000 raving about, okay, uh, guys, this was a bad idea. This DARPA data sets, they actually suck. They're not representative of what uh, should be going on or not. And he was raving about reproducibility because, uh, yeah, this guy, I mean, it's not clear what technique these guys are using. And uh, they are like, they, it's li like they're just trying to one up the other one and say they have like a point percentage improvement. And so it, it doesn't seem like we're having uh, success here. The funny thing is his, the reproducibility part he talks about, it could have been written yesterday because that's pretty much the way how everything still works in, in academia. But I don't know. It's like, for me it's kind of mind blowing. And uh, people talk a lot about the potential disconnect from academia in some instances. I mean, why are we using a 15 year old data set? And I don't know, maybe it's a joke, right? Maybe it's like, if you're researching this, if you're researching this stuff, you actually have to do it in the KDD 99. It's like a rite of passage or something like that. But anyway, I've never been to grad school, so I would not be able to tell. And again, I'm not here to bash them, right? They're all very scary people, right? <laughs> yeah, man. You guys should meet my friend Kyle. He's a math smuggler. So. <laughs> But anyway, I just want to put you in the mindset, right? You've done your research, and let's assume for a, let's assume for a point that I'm just making a, a bunch of uh, unnecessary fun of them, and you've actually uh, had have this uh, this um, publishing protocols and everything, which you had to try to focus to do specific open data sets. Uh, what I think that could potentially happen, I mean, I'm not sure if this has actually happened before, but I think a potential outcome from something like that. And with apologies to the Gartner hive cycle, I think the guy will get to grad school, right? And he'll be like, he'll go there, and then he'll go to the party, and everybody will be like, turn down for math, da, da, da. you know? And, uh, and then it's, they're gonna come, and it's like, oh, hey, hey, man, I got this like sweet, sweet data set here, do you guys wanna have a look, you know? And then he looks at the data set and he gets hooked on it, and he's like, okay, maybe I can do some interesting stuff on this data set, let's do some research. And lo and behold, he gets a bunch of results. Right? Because there's this, this tiny little thing that we talk about in machine learning, which is called overfitting, which is pretty much that you know a data set so much inside out that you're actually writing, instead of doing machine learning, you're actually writing a program to exactly parse the data set. Right? And uh, it's, it's, a very, it's a very real problem, it, it happens all the time, and it's one of the reasons why was, uh, there's always, in, 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 in model design, you're always, okay, just get random stuff. If you don't know what to get, just get random stuff, because you really want to confuse the model, because otherwise it's like it doesn't have an immune system from, for bullshit or something. And you really have to, to try to keep it uh, on its toes, right? But, and that's the point, the guy gets awesome results, he publishes a bunch of papers, and then I don't know, he goes to his business friend, and they're like, oh my God, let's open a startup, you're gonna be rich, right? The security field is so hot. And, uh, and then they go, uh, and they actually get the customer data, I don't know how, how, how they actually convince these guys. And we get to the results, you know? I, I was expecting this thing to be awesome, right? But then when I try it on real life data, it's something that, doesn't look like it's going to work because you're actually training on a very biased and very weird kind of model and when you actually expose it to real life data, it's like it doesn't know what to do. It does only do, 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 do like the little retarded thing that you, you taught it to. Uh, and then what, what ends up happening, in my belief, right, is that people start, okay, let's not do this math thing anymore, right? The guy gets very frustrated, the business guy like, hey bro, we got to make some dough. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and they, okay, let's do a pivot or something like that. And lo and behold, math is hard, right? Let's go shopping. And by shopping, I mean selling, right? So you, I don't know, you become a general consulting company. You do instant response for people, right? But then that thing that you said you were going to do, specifically about analytics or machine learning, is not actually what you do anymore. 
For some reason, it still lingers in your marketing material, but that's not who you are, right? And I maybe, maybe sound a little bit too righteous, but I don't know, if you kind of get money to build one thing and you kind of don't build it, you're kind of a failure. I'm sorry, right? But, uh, I mean, what do I know? I mean, but th there are a few of these guys, they're like filthy rich. I had to think this morning if I was actually going to take the bottle from the, <laughs> from the, the, the mini bar. So, but it's, the, the point is, guys, uh, I'm pretty sure you're very successful, you're doing great work, but like, you know, let other people play with the ball in the sense, if you're not doing machine learning, just don't crowd your marketing materials with machine learning because it will get people confused, right? There are some people who are actually trying to build products. There's quite a few of startups who are actually trying to build products. And I don't know if the, the worst part is them or the guys who are like, Hey, machine learning, we should just put that in our brochure, right? And it's like, yeah, we, we deliver lemons by bicycles with machine learning. And you're like, <laughs> how do you do that? How does that work? But, I mean, I'm pretty sure you guys would be able to figure that out. I mean, those two guys, those two different types of companies, right? Uh, but there is a sweet spot. There are, there are people that, and there's not like, it's not like I'm talking about myself, I'm talking about a bunch of people who are actually trying to do research and try to develop inter interesting things. So what I'm trying to do now uh, for this next part of the talk is to go through a little bit more technical about if people are telling you about X, this is probably what they're doing. And what are the potential pitfalls in all of that? So, oh, sorry. I want to start with anomaly detection, right? And uh, anomaly detection is kind of interesting for me as a, as, a, as, a, as a solution to something. Because when you are doing machine, uh, machine learning uh, research, when you're doing modeling, when you're trying to figure out what you're going to, to, to train, what you're going to predict again, um, anomaly detection-like uh, stuff, I'm pretty much talking about uh, clustering, I'm talking about uh, decomposition, is actually very, very important for your exploratory phase. Because you just got a bunch of data, and you have no idea what it looks like, what's the shape of it, what you, you can potentially do with it. So you just start asking the computer like uh, questions. Okay, is this weird in some way? Is, 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 is there a normal thing going on here? And um, I guess the point of what, and then you use that knowledge, that the feedback that the, 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 machine, the, the model gave you. So that, then you can actually design something, right, that could, could potentially work. Let me, okay. And uh, so my point is, this is the kind of stuff you do when you have absolutely no idea what's going on. And for me, it's very, it's, it's weird for people to say that, yeah, we're doing anomaly detection. Okay, so you're like, what? You, what are you actually doing? What is, what is normal? What is uh, weird? I mean, what's the measure? W what are all those different things? And to be honest, this actually works very well for when you have a very well-defined process. Right? So this is the, 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 the basis of you have a factory, you're putting together bolts, right? And you want to measure if the bolts that you're pumping out from your bolt making machine, however it's done, uh, it's not like too big or too small. It's, it's, it, it, it stands to that, to that standard that you, you want to do. But then you know the standard, right? And you have an effective way of measuring that. Uh, and even so, uh, when you look at stuff like uh, financial fraud prevention, it's pretty much checking your balance, right? It actually still works well. A lot of historical work has been done. I mean, it's way more complicated than that now. But a lot of historical work was actually based on this. I mean, how much is this guy spending from time to time? And, uh, oh, is he is, 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 has he just been to Vegas and spent like $10,000 in a suite? That could be weird. Oh, no, 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 it's Death Con Week. Uh, never mind. So, <laughs> so uh, but this works because you're measuring one thing, you're measuring like money. So you have only one operation, it goes in or it goes out, right? And so this was clearly picked up very quickly by the DevOps guys. And uh, because when you think about it, they're actually running a pretty tight shop, right? They got all this bunch of server farms, they've got all of these uh, different things that they can measure about the, the performance of their servers. And uh, anyway, how many queries to the database and all those things. And yeah, when you look at all those metrics independently, stuff like anomaly detection, I mean, and, and most people just would do like some ro kind of sort of rolling averages, uh, actually work. But it's like, okay, I know what I'm measuring. I know what I'm thinking about. I know, I, I kind of, I know what or, or should expect 
to be that norm, right? So it makes very easy for a human being uh, to make a decision, right? And it's not like, it, but it's, it, I mean, it's not like if the bolt is like a little bit bigger and a little bit thinner, that means it's a net advanced threat from China, right? That's, that's, that's the leap of, 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 uh, of, of, of thinking that sometimes I do not understand. I want to talk in more detail in that. I'm sp here, when I talk about anomaly detection, I'm specifically talking around network and net flow uh, uh, behavior analysis and also this new user behavioral analysis thing which is the new hotness. And there's specifically three challenges I want to talk about. The curse of dimensionality, the lack of ground truth, and uh, Hanlon's razor which is potentially my favorite. Um, so the curse of dimensionality is not like a 50s monster movie, it's actually something real. Uh, the point is if you're trying to measure a bunch of different things at the same time and you're trying to, to see how similar they are or how different they are, if you think about anomaly detection, the actual problem you're trying to solve is I got this space, let's say I have a square, right, and I have a bunch of points drawn in the square and so which one of these are closest together? Uh, that's probably normal, right, because most of them are there. But the things that are further apart are potentially those anomalies. Uh, the fact is you need to measure the distance, right? Okay, so what's a point? Uh, how, do you d how do you separate a point from another? What's that distance, right? And you, st you, you can do some very simple stuff like uh, Euclidean distance which would be like, okay, you just draw a straight line. Or the Manhattan distance, oh, you have to go like with straight angles, right? I think Manhattan distance is a very stupid name but anyway, it's, it's actually quite intuitive because the island, Manhattan, blah. Uh, the point is, when you start growing the number of dimensions, like when you go, uh, when you go like, okay, it's like now 3D, it's like 4D, it's like 10 dimensions, the actual distances, they stop meaning stuff. They stop meaning anything because it's such a huge space, right? And, uh, and uh, until the regulation uh, on, on, on the Rio or on Las Vegas or the US actually allows uh, mind expanding the drugs during talks, you will not be able to see it properly. It's very hard to imagine, but it's like very far away. Everything's so, so far away. It doesn't make any sense. It becomes very hard to measure distances between things, right? And another way of seeing that is if you calculate uh, like what's the size of a sphere, right? So you've got a cube, a unit cube. What's the size of the sphere inside this? Which you could argue is like what's the unit distance between my point and this other point that I'm trying to measure, right? The actual volume of this uh, sphere compared to the, uh, to the cube becomes very, very close to zero very, very fast. Right? And, there, and this is a graph I, I stole because I was like too, eh, I'm not going to do it. Uh, but uh, the point is the practical result is everything looks the same, right? So what's the kind of stuff I'm talking about? Can you give us a more practical example? Well, let's do net flow data, right? I have a company with N nodes, right? And uh, Okay, all, all machines can talk to them uh, pairwise. All machines can potentially talk to any machine. All machines can talk to any machine in any TCP port or UDP port, right? I choose a port for each one of this. That pretty much means that if I have a thousand nodes, which is like a very, very small org, I potentially have half a trillion possible dimensions, right? So I'm measuring how much information, how much package, how much packets went from one place to the other. So, okay, that's very hard to figure something out, which is anomalous, right? So, I mean, it's all the same. It's all the same. How do people try to break that, right? And there's, and, and to be honest, this is a very, very open problem. And people have been trying to work. Uh, I mean, this is not like security stuff. This is map stuff. This is actually what has been, people have been trying to figure out ways to better represent the data and better represent distance metrics to uh, actually solve this. And those solutions, sometimes they are, there's breakthroughs in, okay, we have this new grand idea which is going to help a bunch of these problems. And some of these, they become very, very industry specific. So b a lot of bunch, bunch of strategies and there's actually some, uh, some companies, right, that are, uh, they are basing their claims on anomaly detection on a lot of research that they have been doing on trying to counter this problem. So some of them believe that, uh, I mean, after, you know, 20 years of research, 
they actually have some very good solutions involving subspaces, involving feature selection, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If that's true, that is actually very, very, very awesome because there's a whole class of problems that can be solved by this, right? This is not just security. Um, uh, I mean, I do get a little bit, uh, you know, side-eye glare because if people had actually solved this, right, we would be, I don't know, uh, first of all, they would be doing a killing in the ad selling market, right? That's for sure. And second of all, uh, we could potentially be literally curing cancer with, with stuff like this because, I mean, Google just started something that they're calling the project baseline which is actually, okay, let's get all this DNA data that we have a bunch of people, let's put all these data sets together and do some anomaly detection to try to figure out what are the genes that are actually not representative. So Google, with all the resources, are going to start to do something similar to this, right, because it's hard. Because it's not a solved problem at all. Anyway, people might have solved aspects of the problem, it might be a good part of their, of their, of their research, right, I just want you to ask, I just want you to try to understand. And uh, you might not be able to understand the, the, the actual technical part of it. I certainly don't. When I say interesting, uh, that means I couldn't get past the abstract. Otherwise, I would, I would totally tell you about the ideas. But what I don't want is that you guys fall prey to this guy, right? We do not want to, the go to have this one weird trick, right? And anyway, the point that I'm trying to make here, guys, is that this is not something that's been new. It's been here forever, right? And it's something that it's, it, it's, it's, it's something that you can just wave your hand away. You just have to deal with it, right? Just deal with it, right? And try to come up with some solutions for, for that. I have to put the other glasses on, otherwise I can't see. Although I would totally do the talk on the other ones if I could. So anyway, uh, the second class is what I talk about uh, normality attacks, right? And uh, which is pretty much the problem when you have that you have in uh, anomaly detection in general, which is there is no real labeling, there's no real ground truth, right? You don't really know what you're holding against. And uh, again, it comes back to the, what I was talking about what is normal, right? When you do the other kind of machine learning, which is labeled, you know that, okay, I'm, I'm, I think that these things are good, I have a, a very good confidence that these things are good, a very good confidence that these things are bad. Okay, now let's just train a model to try to tell the thi these things apart. So, uh, some of the end, uh, the problems of this is there's a symmetry because there's usually much more uh, stuff that looks kind of normal than stuff that looks kind of anomalous. So you have to, sometimes you have to push the models too hard to actually recognize what's anomalous and they become very prone to false positives. And anyone who has ever implemented any anomaly detection uh, thing on their network knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's very hard to fine tune. And it's also very easy to tamper with, right? Because if you're just getting the log data from your environment, uh, I don't know, you can do just like my friends in Waze, right? And uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Waze. You, you kind of use it to, uh, it's kind of a Google Maps-like replacement. And, you, and people like the crowdsource. Oh, there was a car crash here. There was, there's a police guy here. Watch out. So I got, got a bunch of friends, like, it's like, uh, I don't know, 10 to 5, they're about to leave work. They just put a bunch of accidents around their building, like, so that the traffic can all go away. <laughs> And then they can get out and then they can go. Anyway, uh, I'm taking too long here. I have to rush a little bit. Finally, uh, and I think it's the most important thing, even if you, uh, okay, my anomaly detection engine is very accurate uh, and uh, I have solved the, the curse of dimensionality, that's great for you. <clears throat> what does an anomaly even mean, right? Why is, why is it necessarily evil? Right? And this is a thing that I saw all the time is that you would turn on something like an anomaly detection engine and it would pick up all sorts of weird stuff that were not necessarily security instance, right? And it's things that, yay, maybe the DevOps team should have a look at that. Maybe the, the sysadmin team should have a look at that. And this is mostly a problem of, of, of process, of how do you actually put this in. And um, it's funny, you will never see uh, uh, an anomaly detection company uh, specifically only marketing itself as security. It will always use the words performance because that's what anomaly detection is good for. I guess the point that I'm trying to make here, if, you're, if there's a spike on your production server, it, the it CPU starts going a lot, it starts like using a bunch of memory, who is more likely to have done this? Is it the evil hacker or is it the hipster developer <laughs> that just bought a book of Node.js Right? And they, they, yeah, let's bring this machine closer to the metal here. You know, let's bump this thing. And 
I mean, honestly, guys, I mean, it's not, it's, it can't be all that bad. So I just want to get to user behavior quickly. User behavior actually works, right? But you've got to have a limited scope. So all, everyone here who does this product security, so yeah, we, have the, we are the startup or we are this company, we have this, this product on the web. You will be doing some sort of user behavior analysis and some fraud detection kind of thingy on your product. And it works surprisingly well because you have a very limited scope. You know exactly your application inside out. So you can actually uh, program relatively easy all these shortcuts that you, you need to have to go through some of the problems that I described. What bothers me, right? And again, people use anomaly detection to actually then build a classification model, right? But um, uh, what bothers me is it can, can this be generalized, right? Can I really come to people and say, oh, I do file exfiltration thingies with uh, user behavior, which sounds suspiciously like DLP to me, especially because they go and, uh, yeah, it works like a charm. The, ma the math is amazing. You just have to have role-based access to all your users and do inflammation classification on your stiff. If I do that, I do not need machine learning. I definitely do not need machine learning. So this is something that, that bothers me. I, I guess a lot of these people, uh, a lot of these companies, they actually come from uh, more of a military background where this is all a given, right? And I'm pretty sure it, it potentially has good results or interesting results in that environment. It's just that that's not how the thing works in, in the enterprise. Anyway, uh, the other point is if I'm actually doing user behavior in a bunch of stuff, different stuff, what do I do? I average, uh, average it all out? Like all the different, uh, uh, oh, yeah, so I, I was putting a bunch of stuff in my expense system here because I've just been to DEF CON, and then it blocks my access to the, I don't know, the, the work portal because I was totally like, DOS in this. I mean, how does this work? How, how does one thing actually interact with the other? So there's a lot of open questions. I really wish there was a way to build uh, a general um, user behavior thing, right? But, I mean, question mark for me. It's an open question even for me. Anyway, I'm very late. Um, I just want to quickly go to classification. I'm sorry this is a repeat slide, but this, uh, there's no way to top this way of, of explaining classification to someone. So you're trying to tell apart cats and dogs, right? And uh, you're trying to teach the, the program if you want to give the cat, what is a cat and what's a dog, right? The point here that I'm trying to make is it's really about how many cats and how many dogs you give it, how many different cats and how many different dogs. Because if you only got grumpy cats in your, in your, in your uh, data set, you have a serious case of bad labeling because you will definitely not be able to pick this up as a cat, right? Oh, it's a happy cat. There are no such thing as happy cats it's because <laughs> all the cats that I've ever seen are grumpy. So it kind of messes up. And it's, it's a problem that's similar to the problem I was describing about the background truth in the sense that, um, you, you, you're not, you don't have a very good sample. Your sample is a little bit biased. On the same way, if it's all doges all the way down and they're all very majestic and you're totally going to miss this guy. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. I love tuna. Tuna is awesome. Anyway, in specifically in the classification area, there's been a lot of malware activity and that's a pun. That's not activity in malware research. Uh, the point is, Everyone's been doing this. There's been a lot of public data sets. There's been a kind of a renaissance of this sort of, uh, of research. And uh, because a lot of people are actually publish, pub publishing this, publishing those, those, I know, hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes of malware. So that's very conductive to, to actually doing this. My opinion, right, is that we've actually got pretty good in telling malware apart. Like, okay, I already know that this is malware, so I can know pretty much which family it comes from almost automatically by analyzing code paths and analyzing code lineage and things like that. I've seen some very interesting work in that field. But actually detecting it, I mean, just like that, based on this, this stuff, is still kind of not there. And one of the arguments I, I, I use for that is that people, AV companies have been doing that forever. I mean, we all think that this is brand new, but the people who actually started doing this, like, I don't know, I mean, five years ago I was hearing about uh, the implementing Hadoop clusters for uh, storing and actually processing their malware. And uh, I don't know, I don't think they've, we've much, we're much better off. I don't think they, they've actually cracked the problem, right? I mean, uh, people tell me that, yeah, the lead researchers here and there, they left to this other company because the guys at the AVs didn't really believe that that was the way to go. But uh, I don't know, maybe there is uh, something here. 
I just really, really want it to be better than the heuristics button on the EV because that crashes my computer every single time, right? Let's, let's all hope for that, right? But we, again, we have to make sure about the bad data, right? The bad uh, specific uh, uh, labels that you are, you're picking up. So, I mean, the problem is if you're writing a paper and you're doing classification and you're like, yeah, I'm comparing this evilest piece of malware ever with calc.xe, I'm pretty sure your model is going to be great. There's going to be very few false positives. But that's not representative of what is really out there, what people actually use uh, to, to in, in their computers, right? So, I mean, imagine what could we possibly use to compare a piece of evil malware that's able to download and run programs from the internet, you know, access the, 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 the file system, the camera, the location information, send a bunch of data to a remote controller. If there was, was only prog legitimate programs that look exactly like this, right, and do exactly this kind of thing, right? And the point is that looking at that, I almost thought that I had it figured out. Because, oh my God, I know. The, th the thing that tells them apart is that browsers have sandboxes, right? So that's what we should be looking for as a feature. And then I remember, man, sorry, Firefox. Man, we almost had this covered. But uh, anyway, point is good data. Get, it, it's not so much having all the bad samples. You also have to have good representative good samples for the research that you're trying to do. And I'm really beating myself up here, like everyone makes mistakes, right? But how the fuck do I do uh, 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 the, the training of the, my machine learning models? And all that I have for, to, to show for good is stuff from Alexa, it's stuff for uh, uh, not even, I, I didn't think I even got to use Chromium. I was, I was thinking about it, but I didn't get to. So what was, I mean, it was, not only it was different classes of things I was comparing at the time, which were inbound attacks, and of course, Alexa's are more represented for stuff that you're going to get, right? And of course, the model looked okay because it was, I was like, oh yeah, here's a banana and here's a fire engine. <laughs> so, can you tell this apart? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I can. So, um, anyway, the point is don't use bad data for good samples. I mean, look for, a, I mean, there's much more stuff in Alexa, there's some open DNS stuff. Uh, that they released, and uh, anyway, you can go for that. But let me try to wrap it up here. How's it going then, right? So, okay, that was the stupid guy last year. How, how, how have things been? So what I've been trying to do is really to extrapolate information from threat intelligence feeds. So the problem I'm currently trying to solve is if I got a, a bunch of samples of bad data from threat intel feeds, and just like malware, the amount of information that we have available for that has increased exponentially on the past year or so. So there's actually some very good uh, samples there that can be used. Uh, and I'm talking specifically about IP indicators and domain indicators and things like that, right? And uh, so create a supervised model with the, those information, on this information, and give it the same data uh, uh, that an analyst would use. So I get a bunch of IP addresses, right, for analyzing from my tell feed. Where are they coming from? What does the passive DNS look like? And all those different things, right? Why should you care? Well, you should care because I think it's much easier to do all the work in a computer to actually do the first triage, right, than you just doing it yourself. If you want to do it as yourself, I have, I, ha I have released open source, uh, some open source tools that you can use to pull uh, um, threat intelligence feeds from the internet and reach them and do some statistical tinkering with them with the TA TAQ test. This was covered in, in the other talk uh, that I did this year. But I don't know, I think having everything automatic is, is kind of cool. And uh, the actual ground truth that I use, like I said, is the data from the anomaly, from, sorry, the data from the threat intelligence feeds and the data from, it's still a little bit based on Alexa. There's a lot of other different sources that I've been tapping on. And uh, a lot of my research recently has been how can I trustworthily expand the amount of good stuff that I can see, that I can vouch for, based on just these, these initial seeds, right? The good thing about designing this model the way that I did is that I don't have to worry too much about data tampering because the only thing that a potential attacker can actually uh, change is the log data inside the company, right, with which they would be sending me for me to compare this off, right? If they're changing the log data, there's a whole bunch of different problems, right? But they cannot inject something that would look more normal or normalization because I'm not really doing anomaly detection there. All the stuff that I'm using for features is actually external 
to any other company, and they're, very, they're kind of hard. They cost money to change. What IP address you're coming from, I mean, how you, I mean, and the lineage of the IP address, what were the, the domains that were registered to it or not, right? It's hard to change. It's harder for an attacker to change that than just try to inject some random stuff into your environment. But what about false positives? Well, glad you asked. Uh, the point is, it's, it's intrinsic. And it will always be, right? It's just like the 100% security thing. There's no 100% accuracy in machine learning. If, it, if it's that, if you, if you do a model and it's 100%, you've done something wrong. Go back to the drawing board. That is the biggest truth that you can find, right? But I believe it's all about you creating an actual process around this, right? And, uh, and uh, the idea, what I'm, I'm presenting this as, is as a way to facilitate triage. You still have to have a human being who will do the last leg of the, of the investigation, and they'll be able to, to actually um, tell us for feedback, and then that can go back in the model if something was bad or something was not bad. And uh, based on all that, I propose a buyer's guide, right? So it, it, specifically these questions that I've talked about, Right? These are the questions you should be asking the machine learning vendors. Right? And uh, if for some reason you don't agree with them, if for some reason they give you bad answers, if for some reason you try to argue them about the cursor of dimensionality, uh, which is a thing, and they're like, no, 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 we're different, you don't understand, that's the other guys, that's not me, I am very different, you know, you can just hashtag them, not all algorithms. Right? because that's pretty much the argument that they're making. And uh, feel free to tag me as well, of course, uh, but just make sure you disagree with me first uh, in order to do that. Anyway, this is us. Don't take my word for it. You can try it out. We have the, we're trying to get this private beta up and running, right? We have some limited capacity, so take your time. Uh, I mean, it might take a little bit of a while, and that's, that's pretty much all I had. Thank you very much, guys.